Uh, so hello and welcome to our continuing series of birding webinars. Uh, my name is Tyler uh, and I'll be your presenter today uh, for learning about birding, eBird, and the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, if you're like me, I've already attended a bunch of Great Backyard Bird Count webinars, uh, but I hope to present on something that maybe you haven't seen yet. Uh, so we'll be focusing a little bit on bird identification skills. Uh, we're also going to get in, see, we're going to figure out how we can get involved in the Great Backyard Bird Count, what it is, the history of it, um, and what you can do as a participant um, in your own backyard or neighborhood park. If you've not par participated in, in our webinars before, if this is your first one, um, welcome. That's awesome that you're here. Uh, and all of our past webinars that we've been doing for almost a year now, um, they're all up on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can watch those at any time. Uh, so whether you've attended all of our webinars, if you're a veteran, uh, or if this is your very first one, uh, we welcome you and we're glad that you are here. Again, we are recording this webinar, um, so don't worry about scrambling to take notes. Uh, if you miss anything, you can always go back. I will have it posted on our YouTube channel later this afternoon, and I'll be sending out a link to all of our registered participants, uh, along with relevant resources, as well as the PDF of the slides that I'm using today. So I wanted to teach you all about bird identification and birding tips um, and tricks to hopefully get more folks out there observing birds uh, and submitting data to a community science database, um, which we'll cover how to do in this webinar, uh, because you can do this all the time. You don't need to submit data only during the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, you can do it any time and any day. Uh, so hopefully these tools will get you started and begin a really fun journey through community science. So Zoom is the platform that we use for these webinars. I'm sure we're all experts on Zoom. Uh, I just wanna make sure that everyone can figure out how to use the chat function today. Um, you won't be able to do your videos or mute, I'm sorry. Uh, I would love to see all your faces, um, but just it helps the technology run a little bit smoother if we have our videos off um, and muted as well. So you can see on my screen, um, I am full screen right now. If you wanna dock your chat window, all you need to do is push escape on your keyboard or exit full screen at the top. And then you wanna hit that little chat button at the bottom and that'll dock your chat window on the side. Uh, again, I wanna make this as interactive as possible. So feel free to type in questions or answers or hellos into the group chat. I'm hoping we can all have a, a fun conversation on that today. And if you have any questions that come up or any technological things with Zoom, feel free to just enter that into the chat window as well. Um, and somebody will definitely help you out. So we're gonna start this program the same way we start any of our programs, whether we're in person or virtual. Uh, and that's by getting to know you all a little bit better. Uh, so in the chat window, to make sure we all know how to use it, uh, please type in where you're zooming from and the last really cool bird that you saw. Uh, so maybe you've been out birding recently and you've seen a really cool bird, or maybe you haven't been out in a while um, and the last one that stands out in your mind. So enter into the chat where you're zooming from. Uh, we'd love to see where, where people are, especially since this is pretty large now with the virtual, people could be in a whole different country. Um, and the last cool bird that you saw. Awesome, I'm guessing that Tom saw the Sandhill Crane at Bar Lake that's been hanging around this winter. That's pretty cool. Ooh, a brown thrasher at your feeder. That's awesome, Karen. Kestrels. The Cornell bird cam. That's awesome. Carolina wrens. Oh, I love those birds whenever I'm on the East Coast. <laughs> the flickers. <laughs> uh, that's a, not the best noise ever. Cool. Well, continue to, to enter where y'all are coming from. I love looking back at this after the program and seeing where, where folks are tuning in from and, and the, the birds they've been seeing um, because we are in the depths of winter. But as you can see, we're all still seeing birds, um, even though it's about to get really cold, especially in Colorado. Uh, so thanks for, for figuring out how to use the chat. Um, it's cool that y'all are seeing some, some pretty awesome birds. All right, so a little bit about myself and Stacy. Uh, so my name is Tyler Cash. I am the Camp and Community Coordinator for the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, and I'm gonna be your presenter for this wonderful webinar today. Um, and the last really cool bird that I saw was a redhead duck that I saw out at Bar Lake when I was working out there last weekend. Um, I love just seeing large flocks of ducks, which there are a lot of right now with the open water out at Bar Lake State Park in Colorado. 
um, and picking out the individuals in those large flocks. And joining with me today is Stacy Monahan. She's our camp and family program coordinator. Uh, and she's monitoring that chat window. So she'll be answering questions if she can. Um, she'll also be helping out with any technical issues as well. So she's hanging out in the chat today. And the last cool bird that she saw uh, was a Northern Pintail. Uh, both Stacy and myself were working out at Bar Lake this weekend. Uh, so we both saw some cool waterfowl, which I think it's a great time to see waterfowl in Colorado during the winter. I personally love waterfowl. So uh, glad y'all are seeing cool birds and, and we are too. So this, if this is your first program with us uh, ever, I just wanna let you know a little bit about our organization. And if you already know about us, that's great. I wanna re reiterate, reiterate um, why we do what we do. Uh, so our mission at the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies is to conserve birds and their habitats. Uh, and we strive to do this through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. So we use this three-pronged appro approach uh, to accomplish our mission. Um, so our science team, they're out there advancing knowledge. They're collecting data uh, from the border up into Canada, down the Rockies, all the way into Mexico. Uh, so they're really focused on studying not only the breeding, uh, but also the non-breeding ranges of, of migratory birds. Our land stewardship team, they're out working with private ranchers uh, to make sure that their ranches and their properties are as environmentally friendly as possible um, and that they are leading with, with con conservation uh, ethos and just making sure that since their land is their land that they can still profit but also help save uh, the world as well with their lands. And then the education team, uh, which myself and Stacy are a part of, uh, we're really just out there trying to inspire not just the next generation, uh, but all generations really, uh, to get out and foster a love for birds. Um, because once you foster that love, it's gonna be a lot easier for, for all of us to help conserve these wonderful, these wonderful animals. Um, so again, our work, we radiate all throughout the Rockies and the Great Plains into Mexico. Um, and with these virtual programs, we're now able to reach a lot larger audience outside of Colorado, which I think is, is definitely a plus with these programs. So what exactly are we going to be learning in this, this wonderful webinar that I'm presenting today? Uh, well, first off, we're going to learn just some basic birding tips. Uh, I want to make sure that we all have a foundation, whether we're expert birders or we're just learning. Uh, we're going to learn some basic birding tips for us to identify birds. We're going to learn specifically what the Great Backyard Bird Count is, why it's important, and why I'm presenting a webinar to help you uh, participate in this. We're going to learn how to use a wonderful database called eBird. Um, so we're gonna go briefly through that because that's one of the tools that you will need in order to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. And then at the end, just like most of our webinars, we're gonna identify some backyard birds that you will hopefully see this weekend while you're participating uh, in the Great Backyard Bird Count. So just a quick little story. Uh, well, I always, I grew up just observing nature, being outside, um, observing birds, but I never really took the time to identify and to really dive deep into natural history uh, until I, I went to college. Um, but once I was in college, I was learning outside, um, I was studying natural history, uh, I really learned how to identify birds and plants. Um, and once I learned that skill, it really opened up this whole new world for me uh, that made life a lot more exciting. Um, like my professor, one of my professors would say, if you study natural history, uh, you'll never be bored because there's so much to identify out there in the world um, and to learn about. Uh, so ever since I've gone down that journey, I've never stopped nerding out uh, and learning more about the natural world uh, because it is a wonderful place that we live in. And I hope that we all can foster that love as well. So why birds? Why is Bird Conservancy of the Rockies an organization? Why are there other organizations like us throughout the world? Uh, well, for one, birds are extremely inspirational. Uh, they inspire us from artwork uh, to engineering and airplanes. Um, they've just inspired humans, mostly because they fly and they have feathers. Um, they've just always been really inspirational to us as humans. Um, they're what we consider an environmental indicator uh, so birds are one of the first groups to be affected by environmental change. Uh, we saw this firsthand in Southwest Colorado and down in New Mexico this year with the mass die off of migratory birds um, because they, they weren't getting enough of their food source. 
uh, which could have been because we got an early snowstorm. It could have been from fires. Um, we're still studying it and trying to figure out what, what happened and, and how we can help and make sure that there is a food source uh, for these migratory birds. They're also what we consider ecosystem services. So we need birds in our ecosystem uh, to help with pest control, to help disperse seeds. Um, they're vital to, to how an ecosystem runs. Uh, and my favorite, favorite one about birds is they're extremely accessible. So no matter where you live in the world, you can find a bird. You can be in the middle of a city uh, and you can look out a window and find birds. You can be out in wonderful nature, out in the forest or in high alpine. Um, just basically wherever you are, you can find the bird and you can observe it and study it. Um, and I think that's something that's really unique to birds. So what is birding? Uh, we've had all these webinars about birding and birds, but we've never actually gone to the depths of, of defining it. So I really wanted to, to break this down so we all understand uh, what birding is. Uh, so bird watching or birding, it's one and the same. Uh, it's a form of just wildlife observation, uh, but we focus on birds and it could be a recreational activity or it could be done for, for citizen or community science. Um, it can be done with the naked eye. I know I never stop birding. Um, I'm always looking at birds, either with binoculars or just my own eyeballs. Um, or you can use binoculars or scopes. Um, you can listen at bird sounds. You can even watch public webcams. I saw, I think it was Laura in the chat said she was watching Cornell's webcam. If you're watching a webcam, you are bird watching. Um, you're just not seeing them, you know, you're seeing them over a screen and not out in nature, but that's still bird watching. So we can split these definitions up a little bit further uh, to get into the nitty gritty of it. Uh, so basically what a birder is, if you've ever thought about this, um, th these are all defined in a birding journal. Uh, so a birder, uh, it's the acceptable term used to describe the person who seriously pursues the hobby of birding. Uh, so you can be a professional birder or an amateur birder um, or moderate, <laughs> any of them. Uh, birding, the definition of that is just a hobby in which individuals enjoy the challenge of bird study, listening, or other general activities involving bird life. Um, so just getting out and birding and really enjoying it. And then a bird watcher uh, is a pretty ambiguous term, uh, but it's used to describe a person who watches birds for any reason at all. Um, so whether you watch it just because you notice it walking by, or you watch it because you're watching its behavior. Um, but you don't wanna mix up a bird watcher with a birder. Um, if you're a birder, you're, you're a little more serious. Um, but I think as long as you're, you're watching birds and you're, you're enthusiastic about it, uh, I think that's all that really matters. Um, but these definitions came from a birding magazine that was published back in 1969. Uh, so next time you're out birding, you can think about these definitions and, and where you wanna categorize yourself. Uh, and I'm sure even after this webinar, uh, even if you considered yourself maybe just a bird watcher, maybe after today it will transform you into a serious birder. Um, so to make that next step from being a bird watcher uh, to a birder, we need to learn the steps that we use in order to identify different species of birds. So maybe you've seen this at our, on one of our webinars before, so we'll go through it a little quick, um, but I hope that we're all able to apply these these steps a little bit later today or during this weekend during the Great Backyard Bird Count. So in order for us to identify a bird, we have to find a bird. Um, we can think about birds and identify them, I guess. But you wanna locate a bird out in nature. And the first thing I always like to do is, is compare its size. Um, this comes just really naturally over time, but you wanna compare the size to either something that you know. So maybe it's bigger than a crow, smaller than a robin, the size of a Canada goose. Um, so you wanna compare the size and then you wanna see what is the most noticeable thing about that bird. So in the chat, I want you to you can get your typing fingers ready. I'm gonna give you a bird and I want you to just automatically envision it in your brain uh, because most of us probably know this bird and then type in what you think the most noticeable thing is about that bird. So in the chat, tell me what the, noticeable, the most noticeable thing is about an American Robin. So when you look at American Robin, what's the first thing that stands out to you. Oh, they're all very similar. Awesome, they're coming in quickly. Um, some fast typers out there. Yeah, so that red breast that we see, kind of that rusty color, 
um, we, we see that automatically, even if we just envision it in our, in our heads, we think of a robin as having that, that red breast. So that's what we would call a field mark. A field mark is just something that stands out to us uh, without us having to dig in too much. It's something that, that is noticeable, um, like the breast of a robin, the red breast of a robin. So once you've got that, you've got your quick look, you've compared its size, you've got the field marks down, uh, then you wanna start with the head and you wanna work your way down to the tail. And this is where you're really going to be looking um, for different field marks of, of the bird and where they're located. And this will really help you uh, determine what kind of species it is first just finding out what kind of family it is. Uh, so you wanna look at the shape of the beak. That's gonna tell you what that bird eats, whether it's insects or seeds, um, and probably help you to define whether you see that bird in a certain time of year. Does that bird have a mohawk or a crest? Uh, is there an eye ring? Are there stripes? Is there a malar stripe? Um, does it look like it have sideburns? Uh, just compare it to things that you know, uh, but observe those features that that bird has on its head. And then you're gonna work your way down uh, through its body. So is the body lighter or darker than its head? Uh, does that body have that red breast that you noticed earlier? Um, are there streaks or spotting on the breast? Um, look at it, their wings. They might have wing bars, so, so white lines across its wing. It might have a wing patch on it as well. Um, and then you can work your way down to that tail. Um, and is that tail long or is it short? Uh, is it rounded? It might be forked like this barn swallow we have flying on this picture. Um, is it the tail lighter or darker than the body? Uh, there's a lot of things that, that you could see on a bird. And in, in the perfect world, this bird would just be standing perfectly still at you and looking straight at you. Uh, but as we know, as birders, um, that's usually not the case. It, it's pretty rare to have a bird just perfectly looking at you. Um, usually there's backlighting or the sun's in the way, um, or it looks like a black blob or a brown blob. Um, but really trying your best to, to decipher these different parts of the bird and the different things that you notice, because that's really gonna help you uh, go from just identifying the family of bird to getting down to, to the species. So once you've looked at the beautiful creature of that bird that you are observing, then you want to look at what that bird is doing. So the bird's behavior, uh, maybe that bird's up in a tree, maybe it's down in a bush, maybe it's on the water. What is that bird doing? All right, and you can kind of combine steps five and six uh, because the behavior is also going to be what it, the, the type of habitat that it's probably in as well. Um, so watch that bird. I think bird behavior is, is really fascinating and it's doing something for a reason, probably through survival or eating. Um, so what is that bird doing? That'll help you narrow it down as well, uh, the habitat that you're in. And either you've gotten a really great look, you had that dream look, like you couldn't have looked at it any longer. Uh, that's when you wanna crack open what we call a field guide. Um, and a field guide is basically just a dictionary of birds. Um, so a field guide can be a book like the Sibley field guide, which I think is the best, but that's just because that's what I use. Um, there's also a Kaufman field guide, National Geographic, Audubon. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, you got to find out what you like best or what you have avail available. And that's where you're going to look for a match. Um, and you're going to start with a family, whether you think it might be a duck or a finch or maybe even a wren. Um, and once you have that family, you'll really be able to narrow it down. Um, and it's really important that we look at range maps, which I'll go over in a second. Uh, but another great thing with technology, which I'll be talking a little bit more in, in, a, in a little bit, um, is the Merlin Bird ID app. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of us on this webinar have heard about Merlin. Uh, but if you haven't, something cool about the Great Backyard Bird Count this year uh, is you'll actually be able to submit submissions through Merlin. Um, and we'll go over a little bit how that's going to work this year. Um, but I know I have Merlin on my phone um, and I always have my phone on me because that's what we do nowadays. Uh, it's really nice when I don't have it on me, but I don't always have a field guide. So having either my field guide on me or my Merlin bird ID app on my phone, um, that's going to help me identify birds that I might not be able to, to identify because you never know what you're going to see out in the world. So when we look at range maps, uh, it's really, I feel like, to me, the range map is the power of deduction. I think birding in general and identifying birds is really just using a power of deduction. Uh, you are taking out what you know that bird isn't gonna be based on what your field guide is telling you. Uh, so the range map is gonna tell us when a certain species 
uh, is in an area at a certain time. Um, feel free to, to type in the chat if you might know the range map of this bird um, while I'm going through it. I'll give it away at the end, but maybe you can identify it just on this range map. Um, but a range map, again, is going to tell you where that bird is at a certain time of year. Um, so this range map, which you would see on Merlin, um, are all about birds. They split it up between the breeding, the non-breeding, and the year-round. So breeding is when a bird is, is breeding, which is usually in the spring um, or, or late winter into spring or summer. That's when they're, they're, having, they're nesting, they're having their babies. Um, it's just the breeding time. Uh, the purple on this map is going to be where you can see this bird year around. Uh, so you can see it kind of dwindles kind of in the Midwest and then expands again uh, towards the East Coast and, and a little bit in the Midwest. You can see this bird year round. Um, and then the non-breeding is going to be during winter. Um, so that's where you can see that bird in the winter time. Uh, I know a lot of our summer campers, when we're, at, we're working on identifying birds, um, we get really excited. Um, and they'll be pointing at a bird and they'll say, I think it's this bird. And maybe let's say it's like an albumatal falcon. And we don't really see that here in Colorado. Um, and there might just be like a white blob during, over Colorado. Um, so that even though that bird might look like that, um, we can actually take that bird out because according to our range maps, you cannot see that bird in Colorado during that time of year. Um, so really, really important to, to use range maps um, because that's really going to help you narrow down uh, because there are a lot of birds in the world and it is a, a pretty hard activity. Um, and that's why I always say birding is it's a lifelong hobby. You're going to, if you start, you're going to probably be doing it the rest of your life and you probably won't know every single thing about every single bird. Um, all you have to do is go to a different country or go to the other side of North America and you'll have to start all over again, um, which is why I love birding. So now that we've talked pretty quickly uh, about just some general guidelines to identifying birds. Um, we're going to take this, this knowledge, hopefully that's stuck in your brain through this, my really fast talking, um, and we're going to apply it to this really cool community science event um, that's going to be happening this weekend. So the Great Backyard Bird Count, or as you've probably seen it as the GBBC, um, which is really hard to say five times fast, uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count, it was launched back in 1998 by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is based out in Ithaca, New York, as well as the National Audubon Society. So the Great Backyard Bird Count was actually the first online community science project that collected data on wild birds, but also displayed the results in real time. Uh, so something really cool about the Great Backyard Bird Count um, is you can go on during this weekend when it's happening on birdcount.org uh, and you can actually watch the map. So there'll be a map of the world and you'll see little flashing lights that come up whenever somebody submits a checklist throughout the world. Um, it's pretty fun just, just to watch and see where, you know, you'll see a checklist submitted in, in Europe or in South America or Central America. Uh, I think that's something that, that sets the Great Backyard Bird Count uh, apart from maybe the Christmas Bird Count. So this tradition uh, has been happening for about 24 years and it happens for four days in February every year. And they usually have it planned around President's Weekend. Um, I don't know why, probably just because maybe people have a little more time, um, but they wanted it to be in winter for them to really see what birds are residents in certain areas. Um, so the count is this weekend, which is why I'm presenting this webinar today. Um, it worked out perfectly. And it, it runs from February 12th so tomorrow, Friday, February 12th through Monday, February 15th. So over these four days, people can spend time in their, in their favorite places, uh, watching and counting as many birds as they can find and then reporting them to eBird. Um, so this can be done in your backyard, like the title, The Great Backyard Bird Count says, or you can go out to your favorite state park, you can go out to your, your neighborhood park, you could literally be inside and watch your bird feeders and participate in The Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, so all you really are going to need to participate in this are, are just some tools uh, that you can use, which I'm going to go over uh, after this slide. But these observations that we submit during this Great Backyard Bird Count weekend, uh, these are going to help scientists better understand the global bird populations uh, before one of their, their annual migrations. Um, so they have it in February because that's before birds are going to start migrating. Um, back north to their, to their breeding grounds. 
Um, so in 2013, the Great Backyard Bird Count, uh, it actually became global because they started using eBird as their database. And I think this has, is gonna, has greatly helped um, them grow every year and, and get more people to attend the Great Backyard Bird Count um, every single year. So how can you participate? Uh, how can you as an individual, as a birder, as a human being, um, how can you participate in this? So all you need to do is find time during Friday the 12th through Monday the 15th and to go outside or to a window uh, for at least 15 minutes. You wanna make sure you set aside at least 15 minutes, which I'm sure even the busiest person on this webinar can find 15 minutes this weekend uh, to do this. Um, so you can do this again in your backyard, your neighborhood park, your favorite local birding hotspot, um, or from your couch, looking out your window. Um, so once you have your location, you then wanna pick what tool is going to work best for you. So there's a couple of tools that you can use, which I'm gonna go through um, in these next, next couple slides. So if you're brand new to birding, maybe this is, you've never really identified many birds. Um, you might know maybe what a, a robin is or, or a red-tailed hawk. Um, but if you don't know uh, those other birds that visit backyards um, or are in your area in the winter, <clears throat> I would suggest using the Merlin Bird ID app, uh, which I talked a little bit about earlier. Um, and that's going to be a way that you can actually submit data to the Great Backyard Bird Count database. Um, and this is something that's brand new this year to the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, so I'll go into a little bit depth, a little bit more depth on how to use Merlin um, after this. But if you know most of the common birds in your area, say you know uh, you, you you know the the birds that are in your backyard, you can identify them. I would suggest then using the eBird app. Uh, to submit a checklist just because it's a little more accurate, um, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, and then if you don't have a smartphone and you don't, you can't download apps, that's completely okay. Um, I know I, I greatly miss my old flip phone. Um, you can still enter data to eBird using a computer. Uh, so if you have a computer, that's great. But even if you don't have a computer, uh, I'm sure you can go to a local library and you can submit a checklist that way as well. Um, they used to accept paper submissions, you can mail it in, um, but now that everything is digital, uh, they want it entered um, digitally. So the Merlin Bird ID app, um, I could explain it to you, but why should I do that when I can let the folks at Cornell Lab explain to you exactly how to use Merlin in this video. So I'm going to play this video for you, um, and it's just going to go over quickly how the Merlin Bird ID app works, um, and it is a free app if you're wondering. Up. Let's see if I can get it to play. Well, for some reason it doesn't want to play, but that's okay. I guess I'll explain it myself. Um, so the Merlin Bird ID app, I'm sure many of us have used it before. Um, it's a free app that you can download on your smartphone. And it's a field guide that you can use anywhere. And then actually you can download packs for the, the region that you live in. Um, and it's gonna narrow it down to the most likely bird you can see in your area during a certain amount of time. Um, and this is great because it actually goes through those steps that we went through earlier, uh, the steps of how to identify birds and it narrows down your search for you. So all you have to do is enter three things. You have to enter where you are and then you're gonna put the size of the bird so it has a size comparison chart. You're gonna click what you think the size of the bird is you're looking at. You're gonna pick about three different colors that you notice on that bird. Um, and then it's gonna know where you are uh, if you have your location on. And then it's gonna give you a list of about maybe three to five birds uh, with pictures of real life birds. And then you can pick what bird fit matches that, your, your observation. Um, so you click that, that's, that is my bird, and that data will be sent into the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, and Merlin is great since it is with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, your, your phone isn't just making guesses. This is all linked up to, how, to e, the eBird database. So all the birds that come up in your area, that's all from checklists that people have submitted to eBird over the last however many years. Um, so it isn't just a guess that your phone is making, it's making a very educated guess. Um, on what bird it might be. So if you're gonna use Merlin Bird ID app during the Great Backyard Bird Count this year, 
Um, be sure that when you get to the very end that you hit the button that says, this is my bird. Um, because if you don't hit that button, if you just get really excited and then go back to the beginning, um, then your bird won't be counted into the Great Backyard Bird Count database. Uh, so make sure that you select, this is my bird, and then get really excited that you identified a really cool bird. Um, and that will be sent into the database, that one species. Um, so if this is your first time identifying birds, or if you don't know what that bird is, or you're not too sure how to use a field guide yet, the Merlin Bird ID app is there to help you participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. So I bring that up because you do actually have to go through all those bird ID steps through Merlin uh, and submit it by saying, this is my bird for it to be added to the database. Um, but if you're able to identify some of the species in your area, um, or you maybe just use Merlin as a field guide, uh, that's the way I use it, um, then I would suggest creating an eBird checklist to submit data to the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, the Merlin app is great. And I think it's something really cool for, for beginners, um, but maybe most of us attaining this can identify a couple of birds and can go through eBird. Um, and eBird is just going to be a little more specific, uh, and that's what we're going to go over next. Um, but if you don't have Merlin, download it. It's an amazing app to have, especially if you travel anywhere or if you just like have your phone on you and you want to observe birds during your lunch break. Um, it's a great tool to use. All right, so the wonderful world of eBird and just technology in general. Um, I love thinking. I used to be pretty anti-technology. I, I didn't like to have a phone on me. I didn't like having being on a computer. Um, but I feel like since we've becoming, we've had these apps come out and it's a way for us to enter data. Um, I think of technology and science as more of a tool for us to use um, and not so much scrolling through social media all the time, but actually using it as a tool. Uh, so eBird is also managed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, if you're in high school and you want to go to a really cool college, I think Cornell Lab of Ornithology would be really cool if you're really into birds. Um, I didn't go there, but I'm sure it's a, it, they come up with so many cool things. So eBird as a whole, um, it allows you to do a lot of things in, in this database. Um, it lets you find more birds, so you can use an explore function to find really good birding hotspots in your area. Um, it allows you to keep track of your bird lists, photos, as well as sounds. Uh, so you might be old school like myself and keep your, your life list on a piece of paper. Um, but if you submit to eBird, it actually will keep your life list on eBird and it will also transfer that over onto your Merlin Bird ID app. Um, one thing I should bring up really quickly, for you to have an eBird or a Merlin, you have to create a Cornell Lab of Ornithology login or an account. Um, so just keep that in mind if you haven't done that already. already you do need to have a Cornell Lab of Ornithology account. Um, but again, that's all free. eBird is also, it's one of the world, it is the world's largest birding community. Um, it's throughout the world and it's growing exponentially. Um, and it's a way for us to contribute to science as well as conservation, even if we're just uh, civilians out in the world in our community. So the goal for eBird is to gather all of this information uh, about birds in the form of checklists. Um, they archive it into a, a giant database and then they freely share, they freely share all that information um, in that <laughs> to share it to power new data driven approaches to science, uh, conservation, as well as education. Um, so eBird is the largest biodiversity related science project in the world. Um, there are more than 100 million bird observations that are submitted to eBird every year. Um, and again, they are growing exponentially with, with their eBird app and just people outside more often and, and curious and, and birds. Um, so they're growing re really fast, which is awesome to see. So they strive to provide the birding community um, with the most current and useful information that's related to birds. Um, and eBird really has changed the way that, that we bird. Um, most of us probably don't keep our lists on pieces of paper anymore. We've probably migrated maybe to, to keep an eBird checklist um, because it is so easy at being on an app. Um, while eBird was around when I personally first started birding, uh, I did not have a smartphone. I remember I was the guy that was anti-technology. Um, and I used to just have my little notebook and then enter it into the computer later on. Um, but the app really just eliminates steps that you have to do. 
um, and it just allows you to submit one checklist, uh, basically just with your thumb, um, which I think is awesome. Uh, so we're gonna dive into how exactly we can use this tool um, to help us become better birders, but we're also only gonna really focus uh, on how to submit checklists uh, for the Great Backyard Bird Count. But if you find yourself having some extra time uh, today or this weekend, I suggest exploring the website. Um, they have so many cool things on that website. Um, I know whenever I have some free time, I love just nerding out on it and, and learning more about birds. So I've used this term a lot. Uh, how can we become community scientists? How the Great Backyard Bird Count allows us to become community scientists or a citizen scientist, if, as you might've heard before. Um, so the definition of a community scientist is just a member of the general public who collects and analyzes data that's relating to the natural world in any way. Um, so this is typically a part of a collaborative project with either professional scientists um, or other organizations. Uh, so as birders, our observations are really greatly appreciate, appreciated to the scientific community. Uh, by submitting checklists into eBird, uh, we really do help scientists answer questions uh, mostly about bird abundance, how many birds there are out there, um, and if they're declining or how they're doing. So I'm sure many of us have submitted a checklist before, uh, but I'm sure some of us have not. Uh, so feel free to get those fingers moving in the chat again. Um, type in if you've never used eBird to submit a checklist before. Um, again, that's, that's, that's why we're here. That's why we're here to, to teach you how to use it. Uh, so type in the chat if you've never used eBird before. Cool, we have some people that haven't used it. Awesome, that's great. Um, just what I wanted for this webinar uh, is people to not have used eBird. Um, and again, I know this is so much information I'm throwing at you. Uh, that's why we are recording this webinar um, so you can go back and, and learn a little bit more about it. Um, it's cool that, that you all haven't used eBird. So I'm gonna go through the steps a little slower. Um, and I see that some of you have the app or maybe you're downloading it currently. I know that happened to a program last night. I had some people downloading the eBird app and um, as well as the Maryland app while I was speaking, which I think is so cool. Cool, so eBird, um, if you download the app, uh, it'll look like this on your screen, whether you have an iPhone or an Android um, or whatever other smartphones are out there. I feel like we just have iPhones and Androids nowadays. Um, but all you need to do is you'll download the app, uh, you'll create a Cornell Lab of Ornithology account um, and if you have Merlin, you already, it's the same account. They're both linked. Um, and to get started, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go out and start your birding adventure. Again, that might be in your backyard. Uh, that might be on a, while you're walking your dog. Um, it can really be any time. And you're going to click this beautiful big button that says start new checklist. Uh, and that's going to bring you to another page. Um, and here I'm just going to pull up this little one so you can kind of see how how it works um, and again if you go on to onto the birdcount.org website there are great uh, eBird tutorial little videos you can watch I'm sure I'm not explaining it as clearly as someone that works for eBird does uh, but I will try my best from an eBird an eBirder perspective um, so you're going to start your checklist and that's going to automatically get your location as long as you have your location setting on and then it's going to give you a list of birds that are, are most likely to be seen in your area. So that'll, again, help you narrow down a little bit more uh, using your field guide. And you're going to go out birding. Uh, maybe you're doing this with a friend. Um, maybe you're just out by yourself. Um, so you're going to start your checklist. It's going to give you a list. And then you're going to start your wonderful birding adventure. And you'll be able to consider yourself a birder. Um, and you're going to identify birds that you see. Um, so currently I'm looking out my window and I actually see there's a common raven in my front lawn or uh, sorry, an American, that's an American crow, not a raven. That would have been really exciting. Um, I have a crow outside my window and let's say I just have one. So I'd go onto my eBird app and I'd scroll down until I saw American crow and I would enter that I saw one American crow and then I'd continue on my journey. Uh, and then let's say I have some house finches that fly that I identified and there's three of them. Um, I would enter three into house finch because that's what I identified that bird to be. Um, so eBird really allows us to enter individuals. Um, and this is really important to the scientific community. Um, eBird does give you an option to enter X 
Um, so maybe if you're out at Bar Lake State Park or another place where there's a lot of waterfowl, maybe you see like thousands of waterfowl and you just, you're not at the point for to identify them all and count them. Um, then you would just put an X into that species. Um, however, I highly suggest as well as eBird um, and scientists, they suggest that you take your best guess um, because X can mean one, it could also mean a million. Um, so if you can take your best guess and narrow it down to how many individuals you think, again, it's an estimation um, that's gonna further help the scientist down the road. Um, so you're gonna go along your, your journey. Um, you're gonna bird, you're gonna have a lot of fun um, and you're gonna enter how many you see of each species. Um, so this is actually a checklist that I did back in May um, down at Chatfield. And these are just some of the birds that I saw. And you can see I didn't have any really high, high counts, uh, but I observed 22 birds during that little um, hour and a half or so, or two hours that I was birding. Um, so you're gonna enter that. And then once you get, you're done, let's say you're done birding um, and you actually see a bird that you think you've fully identified it, but it's not on the list. Um, you can actually go into uncommon species and you can enter rare birds or uncommon birds or a really high count for that bird. Um, you just have to enter some details about it uh, to be, um, because it'll be checked by people on the eBird database to make sure that it's not just this crazy bird that, that you've never seen before. Um, and it does help to take pictures if it is one of those crazy birds. So let's say you're just doing a really common list in your backyard. You've entered one American crow, three house finches, two black cap chickadees, uh, and one red tail hawk that flew over my house. Let's just say that was my 15 minutes in my backyard. Um, I would click that I've, I'm done with my checklist and then it's gonna take me to another page. And that's where I'm gonna enter what, what protocol was I using? Was I traveling or was I stationary? Um, if I was birding in my backyard, I'm most likely I'm just stationary, I'm just watching, uh, but maybe I'm walking and if you actually have your location on, it'll, it'll track your trip for you, which is super helpful. Um, so if you do this and you're traveling, make sure you have that on because eBird does wanna know how far you're going in this birding journey. Um, how many observers were with you? So maybe you're just by yourself, maybe you're birding with friends. Um, you can share checklists with other people. Uh, then it wants to know how long, how, the effort that you put into birding. So maybe that's again, 15 minutes. Uh, maybe it's an hour and 62, an hour and 62 minutes. Maybe it's, it could be any amount of time. Um, but eBird wants to know all these things. It's going to tell them the effort that you put into finding these birds. Um, so that was just a really quick explanation uh, of how to use eBird. It's really user friendly. Um, and I bet every single person on here, whether you're, you consider yourself uh, highly tech or not tech at all, I'm sure if you spent a little bit of time submitting a checklist in your backyard, you'd be able to figure it out pretty quickly, um, which is something I think is great about this app. Um, again, if you don't have a smartphone, you can go onto eBird.org and you can enter checklists that way as well. Um, I guess I'll just pause here. Stacy, are there any questions that have come up that need to be addressed <laughs> quickly uh, before I move on? I haven't really yes. Yeah, someone had a question where they do project uh, bird feeder. Yeah, feeder watch. Feeder watch, there. sorry, I was trying to find it. Um, do they have to submit both? I think they do. Yeah, so for the Great Backyard Bird Count, um, there are two separate projects. So you will need to uh, submit two separate checklists if you want that in your project feeder watch and the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, so great question. You do have to submit both. And then Tom has a question. Can you add additional number of birds if he sees more of them? Yep. So and, I, go ahead. And then just along with the eBird um, process, how important are photos? Awesome. Uh, so, I mean, photos are, well, I'll get to Tom's question first. Yes, you can continue adding that same species, um, especially if you're birding for a while, you're gonna see more individuals. Um, so all you just need, you just need to push like, I think it's just a plus button um, and you can add it. Or let's say you're walking and you have five red winged blackbirds on your list and you're walking a little bit more and you see a flock of like a hundred 
um, you can click on the Red Wing Blackbird and you can actually enter, you know, I saw now there's 105 Red Wing Blackbirds. So you can continue your, your tally um, up using the eBird app. Um, and then that last question, I've already forgot about it, but I <laughs> can pull up the chat. Um, yeah, photos. Um, so photos are, they are helpful if you are a photographer. Um, I am not a photographer, <laughs> so I don't personally enter photos, but eBird is a place where you can enter photos. I um, mean, it's really, really helpful if you do see a rare bird like that sandhill crane that's out at Bar Lake. Um, now that's been seen by everyone, it's, it's not really as rare anymore, but it'll still come up as rare um, on your eBird checklist. Um, but also if you're taking pictures, especially during this weekend, uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count folks really wants those pictures as well. Um, so you can enter pictures of birds that you've taken into the birdcount.org website. You can enter pictures of you and your friends birding. Um, so it can be community-based, it can be bird-based. Um, and then basically they'll take the rights for your photos um, and then they reuse those photos. So let's say you take an amazing picture of an American Kestrel, uh, you might be featured on Cornell at some point and you might become a, a famous photographer, uh, which I think is something really cool. Um, and then one last thing I wanna just talk about with the Great Backyard Bird Count, um, I'm sure there's a million questions we can get to at the end, uh, but if you enter just one checklist into the Great Backyard Bird Count, so whether you use eBird or you just identify one bird using Merlin. Um, again, with Merlin, you can't enter the number of individuals you see. You can only say that you saw that one bird, um, which is why I introduced both of these tools. Um, if you enter just one checklist this weekend, you'll be entered into a, a raffle of sorts, which will have probably like a million people or <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people, because uh, this is worldwide. Uh, you might be able to win a pair of Zeiss binoculars um, but again, your odds might be slim, but I know I'm going to be entering checklists this weekend, uh, probably from the luxury of my backyard, since it's going to be really cold in Colorado this weekend. Um, but maybe I'll win a pair of binos. Um, so I'll get to any more eBird questions at the end, but it looks like we're running a little low on time. Um, so keep them coming and we'll have some time at the end. Uh, but now is time for me to, to stop talking so much uh, and time for you to, to apply some of these skills. Uh, so maybe you've downloaded the Merlin Bird ID app and you want to test it out real quick. Um, I have what's coming up called digital birding. Um, so I have pictures of birds that won't fly away from us uh, that we can spend a little bit of time identifying. Um, I, was, I only picked really common birds that we see in backyards for this, uh, mostly because uh, I knew I'd be running out of time because there's so much information to share. Uh, so feel free to either type in the family of the bird you can type in the species. We're gonna keep this rapid fire. Um, have your fingers ready, have your bird guides open. Um, this will hopefully get your brains moving a little bit uh, before you eat lunch. So we're gonna start with our first bird. Again, just rapid fire. If you know the bird, type it in. If you don't describe it, that's totally okay too. Uh, we're just gonna have a little bit of fun with this. Um, so here is our first bird. I made it a little tricky too with some males and females. Um, so feel free to, to type what you think this is in the chat. Um, and I'll actually pull up a picture of the male to, to really help us. Um, but I try to do both because we don't always see the beautiful, colorful male. Sometimes we see the beautiful, little more drab female. Um, and we wanna make sure we're identifying both of them as well. I love all these things in the chat. I'm gonna get to that in a little bit. But. Awesome, Brian, you know that this is a blackbird. That's a great, great place to start. Um, it's okay to guess people, even if you don't know it, um, or if you just know the, the group or the family, that's awesome as well. It's gonna help you narrow it down this weekend uh, when you are out there birding for the Great Backyard Bird Count. We have some answers coming in. It's kind of a long one to type, I guess. Yeah, well, I, I like that Anne brought this up um, because Males and females can be really tricky. Uh, so we, good job folks typing in, keep, continue to type them in if you, if you know this. Um, so this is the red winged blackbird. And this is a picture of the male and the female. Um, the female really does look like a sparrow um, and it definitely tricks us up sometimes. Um, but if we look at it closely, you can see their beaks are pretty similar. So this beak is gonna be a lot bigger uh, than a, a sparrow's beak. Um, it's going to be a little larger of a bird as well. 
Um, and it has a little bit more streaking on the breast. Um, but whenever I see a female red winged blackbird, it does get my wheels turning a little bit. Um, so that's the male and the female re red winged blackbird. Here's our next bird species, uh, which is another one that we can see in our backyards. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great point, Karen. The pictures do not do justice when it comes to scale, um, but we're doing just quick. With a tricolored blackbird, that would have been really cool. There you go, people, people know the house finches. Um, so again, this is a male and a female house finch that we have here. Uh, if you have bird feeders in your backyard, anywhere in North America, I'm sure you see these um, pretty often. I don't even have bird feeders personally, uh, but I do see them in my front and backyards uh, almost daily. Um, so that's the house finch. We're moving rapid fire here. Ooh, I threw this one in just because I know Stacy and myself, we love waterfowl. Um, so I threw this one in because this one can, can be a little tricky. And I'm glad you entered that, Brian. Um, I was actually, we were outside with my wife and we were looking at some ducks and she saw this bird and she was asking me, why is that not a mallard? Um, I probably didn't do the best of explaining it at the time, um, but I threw this one in there because of that discussion. Uh, so this is, I, I love seeing the mallard and the Northern shoveler. Um, and, and this is why when we are birding, it's, it's good not to jump to conclusion and to really think about it and look at our field guides, even though we don't have the time right now. But this is actually a Northern shoveler. Um, and the mallard and the northern shoveler, they have the same habitat. Um, they live in the same areas. Um, and they, they look pretty similar. Uh, so this has a green head. They have similar colors as a mallard. Um, but if we look at closely at this northern shoveler, you'd be able to tell that the bill is a lot more wide, which is why it's named a shoveler. It has this really wide bill. Um, and the bill is actually going to be a different color than a mallard. A mallard has more of an orange bill. Um, but I wanted to throw this in because I, I, I had a feeling some people would, would think that this is a, a mallard. Um, and you're totally right in saying that. Um, but again, birding can be tricky. Uh, and that's why we want to use these tools like Merlin Bird ID app and Field Guides that we talked about today. Um, and yeah, Brian, the, the bill is a little bit longer and a little bit flatter. Um, it does kind of look... Um, like a bird. And sorry, I know this is, this is really fast. I just wanna make sure we have time for questions. Um, but looking at pictures online of birds and, and trying to identify them is a great way to learn about birds or even just going through uh, your field guide or your Maryland Bird ID app. Um, I learned a lot about birding going out and birding, but I also learned a lot just reading my field guide um, when I was bored and I still do that. Um, so good job, here's a quick rapid fire round of some backyard birds. Um, I wanna make sure that, that we have time again for questions. Um, and I still have a lot to go over. So I'm actually gonna skip this bonus round. Uh, I have a couple more slides to go over, but hopefully you saw these birds, you might know them. Um, and maybe we can see them a little bit later or you can see them in your backyards. All right, so I just wanted to go over this real quick. Uh, this is the several, seven simple actions to help birds. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with this, this is the actions that came out of a study called the 3 Billion Birds Lost um, that Bird Conservancy, Bird Conservancy was a part of. Um, and this was published back in October 2019. Um, basically, we've lost 3 billion birds since 1970, um, which is a large amount. But we want to focus on, on what we can do. How can we help bring birds back? Um, and these are just seven simple actions that we can do. Uh, I won't go into depth with these, but we do have a, a webinar on our YouTube channel called Birdie Backyards that goes into these a little more in depth. Um, but I want to make sure that you all understand if you go out today and or go out tomorrow or this weekend and you contribute to the Great Backyard Bird Count, you've already checked one of these off. If you go to the grocery store and you bring a reusable bag, you can check off you use less plastic. Um, so again, these are seven simple actions. But if you go out this weekend, you watch birds, you share what you see using eBird or with your friends, um, you're already checking off a simple action that you can do to help save birds. All right, and I just wanna bring this up as well while we're on the page of what we can do as individuals. Um, there is a lot of people outside this last year and this year going outside and recreating is really popular right now. It's a great activity for us to do during a pandemic because it's a lot safer outside 
uh, than it can be inside with people. Uh, but I want to make sure that we all understand that our actions at these places really affect how these state parks run, how our, our open spaces are. Uh, so these are just seven quick principles of leave no trace uh, that I'll bring up again really quickly. Um, but we as humans have a big impact on our ecosystems and our habitats. And I want to make sure that we're outside recreating responsibly. Um, so you want to plan ahead, prepare for where you're going. Um, you want to travel and camp on durable surfaces. You don't want to go make a campsite that's not already there. Uh, you don't want to, you want to make sure you're disposing of waste properly. Um, so make sure you dig a, a deep hole if you need to. You also want to make sure you leave what you find. Um, you want to leave behind only footprints, hopefully on a well-traveled area um, and not in the middle of a lake or anything like that. Um, but leave what you find. You want to minimize campfire impacts. Make sure you're reusing. If you are out having a fire safely, um, you're reusing a uh, firing that's already built. You're not building these giant campfires. Um, you want to make sure we're respecting wildlife. We're watching birds from a distance. Um, and then lastly, we want to make sure we're considerate of other visitors. Um, everyone is outside to enjoy it. Um, let's enjoy it together if we can. Um, so Leave No Trace, it's a wonderful organization, um, especially with all the trash that we, that we bring with, our, with us when we go out. Just make sure you're helping the, these state parks, make sure you're helping others. You're picking up trash when you see them and we're leaving places not only the same, but better than they were uh, when we first got there. So lastly, again, that was a, a really fast webinar with a lot of information, um, but at the core of it, birding is a skill. Um, if you wanna get better at it, you need to practice and practice a lot. Go out with your family, go out with your little family pods or your friends that you are allowed to hang out with, wear masks, get out there um, and really practice and learn about how to identify birds. It is a lifelong hobby. If you get attached to it, you will do it forever. And I hope all of you find some time this weekend to submit a checklist either through eBird or through Merlin uh, and participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, if you want to learn more about the Great Backyard Bird Count, just go to birdcount.org. Um, I'll be sure to enter all of these websites into my thank you email um, and just continue to learn and observe birds. All right, so keep in touch with us. Um, Bird Conservancy, the education team, we're doing it all nowadays, whether it's virtual or in person. Um, so we hope if you live in Colorado, we can see you in person. Um, but we are doing family bald eagle walks out at Bar Lake this month uh, on Fridays. Registration is required, and I'll include all these links in my follow-up email. Uh, but I know one thing Stacy and myself are super excited about, being the camp people, um, is our summer bird camps are open for registration this summer. Uh, we will be following strict uh, COVID policies. Um, we've been doing a lot of research on it, but if you have a grandkid or a child that likes birds or even just likes nature, uh, sign up for one of our bird camps. There are scholarships available. Um, and we also just opened our spring migration camp, which will be a very small camp that we're doing this March, um, all about spring migration. Um, and space again is limited for that. So you can find all of these on our Facebook and our website. And I hope maybe we can see some youngsters uh, or some youth out at our, our our programs are our camps this, this year. Um, and very lastly, before we get to questions, um, our next webinar will be next month, March 11th at 11 a.m. And it's gonna be all about great horned owls. So if you've been hearing owls, if you love owls, um, it's gonna be a great webinar uh, presented by our very own Stacy, who was the, the chat moderator today. All right, I knew that was gonna be a long webinar with a lot of information. Are there any questions that need to be addressed, Stacy? Um, thank you for, for handling the chat. I saw that it was blowing up. Yeah, everyone's been fantastic. We did have one question where if you accidentally miss ID a bird, for instance, that Northern Shoveler you put into eBird as a mallard, would they know, would they be able to correct you? So they will not correct you on common species like that. Um, just because it, it, they, they could, it could be northern shovelers or it could be mallards. Um, so it is important that you do take that time and really trying to identify um, and make sure that you, you get it as right as possible. Um, but also let's say you enter it as a mallard, you go home, you're having some happy hour time with your, with your family and you're like, actually, I don't think that was a mallard. I think that was actually a northern shoveler. You can go back and you can edit your checklists um, that you submit. So you can always edit it. 
Um, but again, it is important that you are pretty careful with your, with your IDs. Um, the only thing that you would get uh, an email about would be if it's a really rare bird, um, they would ask for more, uh, for more information about that bird just because it's not a common bird. Um, are there any other great backyard bird count or eBird questions that came up, Stacey, or were you handling it like a professional? <laughs> Handled most of them. We did have a question going way back, that range map, what bird was it? Ooh, yeah, I forgot. That was, I threw that just on a whim. Um, that was the American goldfinch map. So that was the range map of an American goldfinch. Uh, did anyone get it or did anyone guess? That's a hard one. Yeah, no, no guesses yeah. that I saw, but. <laughs> That's totally okay. Uh, well, awesome. I really appreciate everyone that attended this webinar. Um, I'm sorry for spitting so many amazing facts and a lot of information at you. Um, it was a lot to cover in just an hour, but I really hope I sparked an interest in you um, and that you can find some time this weekend to, to use these wonderful tools um, that we call eBird and Merlin. Um, go out there this weekend, figure them out. Again, they are user-friendly. If you have any questions, feel free to email us um, or look on our website or our YouTube for, for other answers. I hope we have some future burgers that come out of this. Um, thank you all so much. We hope to see you either at a virtual program uh, or in person this spring or maybe in the summer. So hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Get out and do the Great Backyard Bird Count. You'll be happy after you do it because there's a scientific study that birding and watching birds makes you happy and it also makes you less stressed. Uh, so I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.